Coming up, I finally get my hands on a plus D disc interface. I play some games. Jeff goes back to his willy. And I end with a type in. Let's get on then. Disk systems for the Spectrum were quite abundant, surprisingly, but their price, along with the absence for a standard for disk storage on the Spectrum, made them a hefty purchase and one that would ultimately fail due to lack of software support. Products on offer included the Clive Drive, the Swift Disk, the Thurnell Disk System, the Watford Espidos, the Disciple, and the Plus D. The Plus D was the successor to the Disciple, produced by Miles Gordon Technology in 1988 who later went on to make the Sam Coupe. The interface runs G plus DOS, which was compatible with the original Disciple, as well as the later Sam Coupe. A later version of the DOS 2A added some features and fixed some bugs. The interface was made of metal, had a snapshot button and a Centronics printer interface. When Miles Gordon Technology went bust in June 1990, the rights were bought by Daytel Electronics and the interface continued to be sold. And this is the one I have, the 2A version of the Plus D interface. The interface was compatible with the ROM routines in the Spectrum, allowing the Sinclair print commands to work through the Centronics port, and importantly, microdrive commands also worked with the disk drive. This was a real accomplishment, and meant existing software that used the microdrive commands would also work with this interface. The drive is a 3.5 inch, double-sided, double-density drive with a capacity of 780K. With all that information, I think it's time we set it up and give it a test. It connects to the back of the Spectrum, but does not have a pass-through port. The included 3.5 inch drive plugs in and sits nicely alongside, and this has its own power supply. We'll come to the printer port later, but for now, let's boot this thing up. Once turned on, and the system disk inserted, using the run command with load DOS. We see the version number of DOS displayed, and we're ready to go. Now we can catalogue the drive and see the contents using the Sinclair cat command. We see the names of any files along with the sizes and types. To format a new disk it's easy. Entering the microdrive format command will work or alternatively the much simplified format D1 command. Both sides of the disk are formatted and then verified before you can use it. A formatted disk gives 780k of storage. A nice amount for lots of games. Using the interface in everyday life would involve loading and saving basic programs. So once we have a nice little program written, we can save it using the microdrive commands or the much shorter save D1 followed by the file name. Once saved, we can load it back in, again using the microdrive commands or the shorter load D1 and the file name. The manual is very good. And there are more advanced features than I'm going to be covering today. And these include opening and closing streams, copying files to streams, and copying files from one disk to another. So now we move on to games. We'll try to load a few games and use the snapshot button to save them to disk. I'm loading via the SVI CAS instead of a normal tape player. The first thing I wanted to try was Birds and the Bees. However, this crashed after saving, and I'm not sure why. When trying to load it back, it crashed as well. This could be the size of the program, or the location of the code, and maybe it conflicts with DOS. Who knows? And this is something to keep in mind. Not every game will work. To get this one to work though, I had to copy the tape files over to disk, and then edit the loader. Luckily, you can do this with some older games. Now to try it. And yes, it worked, which was good, because this is the game that I used for my speed test many years ago. and Birds and the Bees loads in just under 8 seconds, and that's pretty fast. And we can now add the plus D to our list of speeds. Next game to try was Jetpack. This saved fine with a snapshot, and loaded perfectly too. If you want to rename the snapshots, you use the Erase command, which seems a bit odd, but it does work.
Next I tested the Hobbit, and this too crashed, but upon trying again, it worked fine. And then I tried Death Chased, and this worked, so a mixed bag so far. And the games that seemed to work at this point were 16k titles, apart from Birds and the Bees, but that needed tweaking. I tested Manic Miner, and it crashed, the first time, but worked okay after that. And then Sabre Wolf, and that worked. Kong from Ocean crashed, the first time, but then worked okay after that. And Renegade, which worked. There seems to be good compatibility, with most games working eventually. Let's move on to the microdrive compatibility then. To test this I used the microdrive version of Taskword 2, which took a while to get across onto disk, but finally I managed it. I wrote a short note and went to save it out, and there was a slight issue here. Because the content of the disk was shown on screen, the program is based on the microdrive cat command, which lists things down the left hand side, so Taskword puts its file name request on the right. The plus D, however, lists file sizes down the right, so the input is placed amongst that. It looks a bit messy, but it does work. Saving and loading files worked great, with Taskword using the microdrive commands built in. Finally then, the printer port. The interface did not come with a cable, but I had a few others connected to other interfaces that suited the job. Once plugged in, I had to load the config program from tape, go through a few questions about the printer, and then save the final config off to a boot disk. All of this enables the printer and sets up the printer commands. It's fairly easy and takes about, I don't know, 60 seconds. Now we can print out listings using the llist command, just like a ZX printer. We can also do screen dumps using the plus D snapshot button and pressing 1. I really think I need a new ribbon at the moment. And yes, that worked well too. Sinclair's print commands work as well. And this is a great little unit. If you've got everything plugged in though, you do get a mass of cables, which does look messy. I suppose if you had a monitor stand, it wouldn't be too bad, but on an open desk, well, you can see. To sum up then, this is an excellent interface and drive. It's easy to use and fast in operation. It does come with caveats though, in that not all games will snapshot. Some may need a bit of tweaking, and some will just fail altogether. But the majority of those I tested worked fine. If you spent time, you could probably get them all working, but you'd have to first take a snapshot on an emulator, and then use a tool that converts them into a single load, and then get them across onto a disk. Even then, they may not work. And in case you're wondering, the disk cannot be read on a normal PC floppy drive. It was great to use this device, and it gave me a glimpse of what the machine could have been had there been a standard disk interface, or at least disk specification, from the very start. This is SuperCycle, released by US Gold in 1987. SuperCycle is a typical time-based racing game, sat on your 750cc motorbike, hurtling around different courses against other racers, trying to complete each track in a set time limit. The instructions say that there are more than seven courses that pose unique challenges. So how many are there actually? Well, the game has eight, so why not just say eight? Anyway, let's get on. The tracks vary in color, and represent different conditions, with things like ice and water showing up on road surfaces in later levels. There are also day and night racing, apparently, so the game certainly sounds good. The first track looks like grass, with yellow mountains in the background. The road moves very slowly at first, and your rather fat looking rider seems to be plodding along. Using the three gears, 
You can soon get up to a decent speed though, and as the turns approach, try to get round them. Moving at full speed gives you little time to see those turns, but you can usually get around them at full speed. The second stage is desert, with a few cacti appearing from time to time. The graphics are okay, and the feeling of movement is fairly good, but the roadside objects appear only a few times. The game avoids colour clash by using a monochrome lower display, and the turning animation is a bit limited but at least shows the bike leaning. The third section is back to grass again, but this time we have a city in the background. The backgrounds just wrap around the screen though when scrolling, but they do their job on conveying movement. Sound consists of just the engine noise and the occasional tyre screech as you go around corners. There's no noise for passing other riders. There are only ever two riders on the screen at once and when you first start off, they head off into the distance, leaving you behind. You should be able to catch them up though, if you don't crash. And interestingly, once you get past them, others appear, but again only ever two at once. Next we get to bonus level, and here you have to drive on the course and collect flags that give you extra bonus points or extra time. Onto the fourth level and the cyan level. Now I'm not sure what this is supposed to be, maybe dusk or something anyway. And here we encounter water on the road for the first time. Hitting this will slow you down. Level five is all white, I presume snow. And here we get ice on the road as an extra added obstacle. The bike also has less traction here, so turns are slower and you have to be careful not to go off the track. Sixth level we get cyan, and 7th level, back to flag collecting again. The next level introduces a new hazard, barriers in the middle of the road, and these are often tricky to avoid because the collision detection, as you'll see, is way off. This is where my game ended, which wasn't bad for the third or fourth play. The last level I couldn't get to is a yellow desert with pyramids in the background, seen here in the RZX playback. This is a decent racing game, and one that's fairly easy to play. The game has three levels of difficulty, and playing on the easiest one like I did should give you a decent length of play. The change of scenery and roadside objects provides different looking sections, and ice and water and barriers on later levels add an extra challenge. If you do run out of time, your bike just slows to 40 miles per hour, but the game just carries on, still scoring points and even overtaking other riders. All very odd. I enjoyed playing this game, and it's definitely worth a go if you like racers. This is Hunchback 2, released by Ocean Software in 1984. Ocean released Hunchback First, a licensed game from the arcades. Despite the difficult rope swings, it was received quite well. However, it was not the full game. In the arcades, when you reach Esmeralda, you are taken to a different screen, and this is missing from the Ocean release. The game just ends when you reach Esmeralda and loops back to the start. Hunchback 2 is, more or less, that single screen of the arcade game that's missing, taken as the first screen on Hunchback 2 and expanded into another game. The game itself begins with the arcade final screen, and here you guide Quasimodo around the floors, removing the bells by running over them. To get to the other floors, he has to use the ropes at each side of the screen, and this is very tricky to do. Time and time again I got this wrong, and this is very frustrating. It's all about timing, especially the top level. Level 
Once complete, you get a totally different set of screens, just designed for this game, all of them involving collecting bells. The first one of these screens involves jumping on a tiny boat to get across the screen. Quasimodo must be massive. These jumps are more frustrating than the last screen, and this is where I gave up after spending a lot of time. A lot of time. The remaining footage is from the RZX recording. Once up the ropes, he has to contend with a conveyor belt before he can collect the final bell and move on. And the graphics are slightly better than the first game, with the main sprite having much more character. Next we get onto a Horace and the Spiders like rope level. The gameplay is totally different and can at times be very frustrating, as already mentioned, but it's worth saying again. And then a level with sprites that look like they were ripped from Jasper by Micromega. Control is good, it's just that the level design spoils everything and this could have been a really good game. Sound is used well, with some decent music, but there's no in-game sounds. Nothing for jumping, collecting or walking. This for me was a difficult game, and I couldn't even get past the second screen. Overall then, it's a challenging game, with the emphasis being on challenging, that capitalises on the Hunchback license, but it's not one of the standout titles of the year, and it can be very, very, very frustrating to play. <laughs> This is The Lost Treasures of Tulum, released by Retroworks in 2021. A mysterious parchment sets the start of this journey, and our hero finds himself locked inside a tomb. To get out, he has to collect all of the jewels from each room, which opens the door. This is a different game from the usual platformers, but does involve some jumping. The screen is not revealed until the character walks into it, and this means there are hidden traps to be careful of. These include pits, spikes, and moving enemies. You have to move slowly, and sometimes guess where to jump when confronted by a pit that you can't see into. Sometimes you can climb down, sometimes there are spikes at the bottom. Sound and graphics are really well done, and gameplay is different enough to make it a challenge, and not the usual platform game often released. Once you get used to the slower pace, and become familiar with the rooms, it's a great game to play. Highly recommended. A few months ago, 8-Bit Steve posted on YouTube that he'd like to see me cover Manic Miner or Jet Set Willy mods again. He said there must be loads. I had a look, there aren't that many, but one game popped out that I'd really like to cover. It's a game I really like, and this is it, Manic Miner The Lost Levels. The story of Manic Miner The Lost Levels is a really interesting one. It started with an article in Retro Gamer issue 63 by Stuart Campbell where he revealed the lost levels of Manic Miner. These are levels that didn't come from the original Spectrum game, but came from various different Manic Miner ports to different systems. Those systems included everything from the Auric to the GBA. Fast forward a little bit, and a group of very talented developers, calling themselves Headsoft and Proteus Developments, got together and did a package for the Nintendo DS, which was Manic Miner The Lost Levels, but that package was much more than that. The main game in the package is Manic Miner The Lost Levels, in the original article by Stuart Campbell, put together, beautifully recreated for the Nintendo DS. On top of that, you get a bonus 10 levels, called Willy Wood, and then another bonus 10 levels, which come from Manic Miner and other games. When you first load up the Lost Levels, the only thing you can do is play Manic Miner the Lost Levels. The bonus stages and Willy Wood are unlocked by various tasks within the game. 
The bonus stages are unlocked by finding special places in the game which are hidden from view, normally tucked away somewhere in a corner. Willy Wood is unlocked by completing the lost levels. Now this package is really well put together, it looks really good, it is really slick. Every time I play this I always think it would have been really easy for the programmers just to have put together the lost levels, but the programmers went above and beyond adding Willy Wood and adding the bonus levels as well. The lost levels in Willy Wood play like the classic Manic Miney games, you have to collect the object and find the exit and you have a air countdown which means that when you run out of air you die. Bonus stages are slightly different, you can play them in any order and they're done against the clock. In total there are 50 levels in the game, 20 for the lost levels, 10 for Willy Wood and 20 bonus stages. When I first started playing this game, three things hit me. First one of those was how beautifully recreated everything was, and how close it was to the original. Even though it's on the Nintendo DS, Willy feels like he controls just like Willy did in the original Manic Miner or Jet Set Willy. The next thing was simple, it's just how beautiful the levels are, they all look really, really good. A lot of effort is clearly being put into how well this plays and how good it looks. And the last thing is, how difficult the levels can get. Very early on, even the first level is quite tricky. It's very, very difficult, or would be very, very difficult, to go through the lost levels without loss of life. I've played all the levels through, thanks to a very neat feature, which is you can restart any level that you've previously got to. That's a real big help in completing the games. And because of that, unlocking the Willy Wood levels isn't that tricky, but it can take quite a bit of time. The two screen setup of the Nintendo DS is used to good effect as well. The top screen shows you the level you're currently playing and the bottom screen has the text from the original article by Stuart Campbell. If there is a secret on the level, there is a rosette in the top right hand corner of the bottom screen which disappears when you find that secret, unlocking some of the bonus levels. To be honest, the only disappointing thing about this whole package is they didn't do it for the Spectrum. Although, if any clever programmers are out there, porting this back to the Spectrum next would be something I'd be very, very, very pleased to see. When I first started researching this, I downloaded what I thought was the correct ROM. It was the FAT version. However, the music didn't work for me, and I realised that I have to download the EFS version to be able to get the music. The music in this game is pretty good. The title track is a bit tinny for my liking, but you can choose various different tunes to listen to during the game and there's some really really good ones. I particularly like the one called A Somber Moment. I remember when I did my reviews of the Jet Set Willy mods, one of the things I kept saying is I just wanted to see what the next screen was and keep going. And it's a bit like that with this game as well. But also the extra bonus levels are great, I wanted to get through to Willy Wood as soon as I could. And also finding the secret place where you unlock the bonus levels in each screen that has that is a really good challenge. This is an essential download for anyone who, like me, was a big Minor Willy fan back in the day. It's quite easy to get running, it's quite easy to play, and the package itself, as I've already said, has so much in it. It's also a free download, so why wouldn't you? So that's Manic Miner, The Lost Levels. Till next time, happy gaming! This is Sir Lancelot, released by Melbourne House in 1984. Here we have a really nice little platform game, very much in the mould of Manic Miner. Or it would be if it wasn't so frustrating. It starts off really well, with a nice tune, before the level begins. The game relies more on pathfinding than jumping, and using the one-way ladders and drops you have to guide your brave knight around the screen collecting the flashing items. There's a time limit too, so you have to rush around quickly, which often results in death, and the awful death march tune. Level 1 isn't too bad, but level 2 suffers from bad design. It could have been so much better, 
but the timing to get past the knights on the far left and far right has to be pixel perfect. It always results in me losing at least three of my lives. Always, always die here. And it's just annoying, to the point I don't want to play anymore. The graphics are fine, for the period, and move well enough. And the platforms conform to the usual very bright colours, like games such as Manic Miner and Jet Set Willy, Technician Ted, etc etc. Sound is used well for a 16k game too, with various effects for dying, collecting and jumping. Control works well, and once you get used to how it works, moving about is easy. And you then just have to worry about the timings. Using an immunity poke at least lets me play the other levels, and they are mostly well designed. One level has a dead end though, and if you climb the ladder and you haven't collected all of the objects, it's more or less game over. You've just got to wait for the timer to run down, and that is a little bit of bad design. Overall though, it's a nice little game if you can get past the second level. This is Space Waste, originally published in Popular Computing Weekly in June 1983. The page calls this documentary for some reason, but the listing clearly states it's called Space Waste. The idea of the game is to shoot down waste that is falling to the planet, and if it hits, a certain amount of people will die. Each bit of waste kills different amounts of people, so you can pick which bits to ignore if you really have to. You have to be very careful though, you only start with two shots, and you get an extra two shots for each successful hit, and if you miss the first two, that's it, you have no more shots left. The listing is more or less a full page, and initial attempts to run gave an out of data error. This was quickly fixed, but then one of the UDGs in the top right was not working properly. A bit more poking about and fixing an issue with the position of the laser, and we can finally play it. It's quite a familiar style of game for type-ins with random falling items, however, the addition of population numbers and limited shots adds a little bit extra to it. Ok, so it's not the most original idea, but it's ok for a little play. This is probably the first time it's been seen in over 30 years, and it will be available on my website to download shortly.